shadow creatures whose world lies beyond the edges of our own. Elusive, constantly wary, they loom as symbols of secrecy and menace. Their very name, wolves, can evoke a sense of dread. In their songs, we hear the untamed call of the wild. Since our earliest contacts, their true nature has seemed veiled in mystery. The natives who shared with them the woods and plains of early North America respected wolves as fellow hunters, whose success, like that of their own tribes, depended on teamwork. But to other societies, wolves were an evil lurking in the night, the bloodthirsty beasts of our dreams and nightmares. Above all, the haunting image of wolves and relentless attack lingers in imagination, suggesting predators not merely strong, but savage. <laughs> still puzzles us. Is the wolf a proud animal to be revered, or a devil in the dark? Today, one wolf pack has accepted a human presence and begun to reveal the secrets of their long-hidden lives. In contrast to the sinister wolf of fairy tales, recent studies reveal an animal of great complexity. Affectionate, playful, and devoted to its companions, it is the only large predator in North America dependent for survival on a cooperative social unit. The wolf pack, it turns out, is not a random collection of hunters, but an extended, closely knit family. Mother and father, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles, all bound in a life of mutual concern and common purpose. In a remote area of Idaho's Sawtooth Mountains, one of these studies has focused for six years on the behavior of a unique family of wolves known as the Sawtooth Pack. To observe animals unapproachable in the wild, the world's largest wolf enclosure was constructed on the edge of wilderness, providing sufficient freedom for wolves and a tented camp for a crew of naturalists and filmmakers who lived and worked with wolves at their door. The project grew from filmmaker Jim Dutcher's desire to capture images of life in a wolf pack, a nearly impossible challenge in the wild. Wolves are so wary of humans that they're almost never seen in the wild, let alone photographed. I realized the only way to film such shy animals was to form a captive pack of wolves familiar with people but left alone to follow their own natural behavior, their own rules. It was vital to gain the pack's trust so I could observe and film them in a relaxed, untroubled state, very different from the behavior of wolves always on guard around the scent and sight of humans.
While her husband filmed, Jamie Dutcher recorded the intricate language of wolves. We were extremely touched by the social structure of a wolf family. When the pack leader howls, it's often a signal for the others to gather around him. They would pay tribute and respect by whining and licking his face. With their heads and tails held lower than his, you could see the strict hierarchy that maintains order within the pack. Through displays of dominance and submission, wolves establish a social ranking from top to bottom. The rules can be tough, but they're a relatively bloodless way to determine a proper place for each wolf. It's not all competition, though. The Dutchers often observe gestures of kindness. People often misread dominant wolf behavior as fierceness, submission as weakness. But in fact, such actions secure peace, strengthen bonds, and above all, reassure each wolf that it belongs to this family, this pack. Such close cooperation can mean the difference between life and death for animals evolved to survive by hunting as a team. Whether the prey is a bull elk or only a snowshoe hare, wolves know each other's skills and pursue with a coordinated strategy. In the excitement of the hunt, confusion could mean a missed opportunity. Such cooperation defines a wolf family. It has been observed that wolves injured in a hunt are often fed and cared for by the rest of the pack. The job of maintaining pack order falls largely to the alpha, or leader. In the sawtooth pack, the alpha is a male called Kamots. His story began as one of several puppies raised initially in a pen at the camp. We knew that adult wolves might never trust us, so we began by bottle feeding pups at the age of two weeks. By establishing a bond, we hoped that they would accept us without fear, but we made no attempt to turn them into pets. From the beginning, little Kamats was the most spirited and the first to howl. He seemed to us a born alpha. As the seasons pass, the qualities of leadership emerge more clearly in Kamats. He moves with a confidence characteristic of alpha wolves. Tail held high, ears forward, eyes alert. He is large, approaching 130 pounds, and often patrols on his own to protect the pack's territory. The largest undertaking of its kind, situated on forest service land through a special permit, the project affords the sawtooth pack a kind of paradise existence. The wolves live in a setting undisturbed by civilization. But unlike their endangered counterparts in the wild, they roam free of threats from wolf hunters and trappers, with abundant space to indulge in the natural inclination of wolves to play. by the well-being of the maturing wolves, 
the Dutchers decide three years into the project to expand the pack to eight with the addition of three new puppies. You have to listen to him when you grow up. <laughs> He's going to make all the decisions. Yeah. <laughs> Though the puppies will be kept separate initially to grow accustomed to humans, Jim introduces them to Kamats and the others. The pack eagerly inspects two gray pups, a male and a female, and a more reserved black female, the Dutch's name Chamuk. Though commonly gray, nearly a third of all wolves are black. Hello. Relentlessly curious, the pups soon overrun the crew's living quarters. Despite a resemblance to domestic dog puppies, wolf pups display greater aggression, revealing the innate wildness that makes wolves inappropriate as pets. The crew notices that the black pup, Shamuk, explores mostly on her own, as mischievous as her brother and sister, but more solitary in nature. Guys, maybe this will keep you out of trouble. Come on. Come on. As if foreshadowing the more severe competition to come, the puppies clash over a food bowl as if it were a fresh kill. Before joining the adult pack, the puppies are moved into a fenced area surrounding the tents. They begin to establish their own hierarchy. But the adult wolves ensure that the skirmishes remain harmless, and a warning arises if things escalate. Pups, now almost seven weeks old, begin to learn from their own kind. The individual personalities now emerging will soon determine their roles in the pack. One role in the pack is not sought, but endured. The pack Omega, lowest in rank, must constantly yield to the others, who often treat it as a scapegoat. In the Sawtooth pack, the Omega has long been Lakota, the brother of Kamats, the leader. Omegas serve a useful function, often defusing tension by initiating play, but theirs is a difficult existence at the fringes of pack society. After weeks have passed, Jim decides the time has come to release the pups, now three months old, into the pack. Pups and adults alike seem to sense that something is different this day. Befitting his authority, Kamats is the first to inspect his new charges. Instincts govern. The pups yield immediately, presenting their vulnerable undersides as a sign of complete submission. Any concern over acceptance of the pups quickly vanishes. The entire pack seems exhilarated by their arrival. Adult wolves love young puppies and devote themselves to protecting, teaching, and nurturing them in the first months of life. But as they mature, the pups will have to establish their own position in the pack hierarchy. For the newcomers, social ranking may already be underway. While the gray pups integrate well with the pack, the black pup, Chamuk, plays by herself.
Within a month, a harsh aspect of pack life is revealed during feeding. Though the pack can hunt small game, the Dutchers supplement these meals with roadkill, deer, elk, and antelope. Now three and a half months and 40 pounds, the gray pups meet no resistance as they join the feast. But the black pup, Chamuk, stops short, seeming to sense that she's unwelcome. Tension prevails around a kill. Tails tucked in apprehension, even the gray pups keep a wary eye on the adults. And all keep an eye on Kamats, the alpha, who wields absolute authority, dictating who will eat and when. Such dominance by a strong leader establishes order in the pack, and submission in turn ensures harmony and stability, enabling the group to survive as a well-knit unit. Hoping to eat, Chamok approaches. An alpha seems to have favorites in the pack. No one knows why. And the favorites can change. But for now, Chamuk is not among them. In contrast, one adult devotes himself to looking after the pups. Matsi, second in command as the beta wolf, serves as the pack's puppy sitter and peacemaker. Perhaps accumulating allies for a future role as Alpha, but also benevolent in nature, Matsi seems genuinely concerned for each youngster. Eventually, Chamuk will be allowed to eat, but her rejection bodes well for another. Years back in submission, Lakota the Omega seeks acceptance from Kamats, as if lobbying for a new position. If the black pup Chamuk should become an Omega, the hostility directed at Lakota could diminish somewhat. Months pass, the growing pups seem completely integrated into pack life. The vitality of the pack pleases Jim Dutcher, but he faces another concern. Though a foundation he created ensures the pack's future care, the permit for this land will soon expire. He must find the pack a new home. Questions over the future of the Sawtooth Pack draw a visitor from across the state. To the northwest of the project lie the traditional homelands of the Nez Perce tribe, a once powerful Indian nation that long ago befriended Lewis and Clark. Today, a member of the tribe pays a visit to animals held in great esteem by the Nez Perce. Here, Tribal okay. council member Carla High Eagle tells Jim that her ancestors considered wolves to be animal brothers. The present leaders of the Nespers want to learn more about the Sawtooth Pack. Dutcher hopes the tribe might offer the wolves a permanent home similar to this one on their reservation in northern Idaho. None of them will come to us if we ask them to. Mm. Yeah, everything's on their terms. Yeah. And he's just sort of investigating you. And this is the Omega? Yeah, and he's at the bottom of the pack, where Kamatz is the leader. Mm. Even though we have names for these wolves, they don't respond to their names. Mm. They, I don't think they even know their names. Intent on finding the pack a lasting home, Dutcher is encouraged. The deliberations will take time, 
but the Nez Perce will consider leasing land as a permanent home for the pack. The snows of one winter seem quickly followed by the snows of the next. As nearly two years pass, the pups turn to full-sized pack members, still habitually playful. Chamuk, alone as a pup, is now increasingly eager to join in the play. Chamuk's changing role seems due to encouragement by the caretaker, Matsi, both supervisor and participant in the games. While Lakota, the Omega, remains cautious and apart. Chamuk may yet avoid the lonely role of an Omega. For wolves, as for humans, childhoods are long. In the constant exchanges of play, lifelong bonds are formed between individuals, and the entire family is strengthened. For the Dutchers, life with a wolf pack imposes continual challenges. Winters in the Sawtooth Mountains can amass 200 inches of snow or more. They pass months bundled in layers of clothing, engaged in endless chores, clearing snow so the roof won't collapse, packing in supplies, repairing frozen equipment, and keeping the path to the outhouse open. Yet the hardships of winter have little effect on the wolves, fashioned by evolution to cope easily with cold and snow. Long legs prevent bogging down. Narrow chests act like boat keels to plow through deep drifts. Competition, especially on kills, is unrelenting. Kamats, the Alpha, announces through body language and sounds of dominance that the kill is his to divide. Every vocalization, from growls to whines, has meaning in the elaborate language of the pack. Now there's a change. Chamuk driven away and made to wait as a pup, is now allowed to eat. But Lakota must wait. His attempts to escape the Omega role have failed. In a society where status is fluid, however, Shamuk must remain cautious, eyes trained warily on Kamats. Aware of the risk, a hopeful Lakota approaches. Kamats notices. Pack rules must be obeyed. The Omega must wait. While Kamats allows, the others gorge. 
Because feeding can be infrequent in the wild, wolves have developed the capacity to consume up to 30 pounds in a single meal. Even ravens manage to feed before the omega. Lakota turns to his only option. He begs his brother for permission to feed. Kamat seems to relent. But when Lakota tries to sneak some scraps, the others turn on him. Pack life is a marathon of rejection for an Omega, but it offers more security than a solitary existence. So an animal like Lakota accepts his treatment. Though their jaws are strong enough to crush the bones of a moose, wolves rarely injure an Omega seriously. He is both an object of contempt and care. Eventually, Lakota will be permitted to eat. But for now, you must wait. Howling, first as an experiment, Jim found to his surprise that the pack often responded. Bonds he established when they were puppies have not diminished. Perhaps few humans have been so thoroughly accepted by wolves still following wild behavior. Undeterred by his presence, they are quick to tangle in competition only inches from him. I would sit among the pack in a submissive posture, letting them know that I wasn't any threat. Wolves instinctively fear people, but they're also friendly and curious towards us at times. We're remarkably alike in ways, devoted to our families, concerned with status, living as societies. I believe in some way they regarded me as a member of their pack. would sometimes flop down next to me and mimic whatever I did, even extending a paw as if declaring me his friend. I can't think of a greater honor. With the need to find a new home for the pack still weighing on his mind, Dutcher accompanies Carla High Eagle on a winter visit to the pack. She brings good news. The Nez Perce will allow the foundation Jim created to establish on tribal lands both research and education facilities and an equally large territory for the pack. Jim must now devise a way to move the wolves and gauge the best time for their relocation. The Dutchers have now passed many years in the remote, tented camp they call home. Though the temperature on a night like this will drop to minus 40, they try to maintain some of the comforts of ordinary life. But the mood this evening is subdued. The approaching relocation of the pack is cause for relief, but it also means the end of the project and of their relationship with the wolves. For many people, a night surrounded by wolves would seem eerie.
but over the years we have grown so close to the pack that their presence nearby seemed comforting. We would often lie awake listening to them move about in the dark and howl into the absolute silence of the night. As she has on so many other nights, Jamie records the language of wolves. Just as they have distinctive personalities, wolves each have a unique howl. Surprisingly, though he is the lowest in rank, Lakota, the Omega, has the loveliest and most expressive voice. Wolves howl for more reasons than we will ever know. To communicate with neighboring packs, to express joy or sorrow, to rally in solidarity. There are few more complex or beautiful voices in all of nature. Hearing their conversations made it feel as if they were companions sharing the night with us. I can't imagine never hearing them again. awakens beneath an overnight snowfall. So little heat escapes their bodies that snow does not melt on their fur. A double coat of outer guard hairs and under fur as dense as wool. The three youngest wolves have now reached maturity. Two are females. Chamuk, calm and watchful, and her sister called Wyakin by the Dutchers. Now almost 80 pounds, she towers over Jamie. And though Snowfall does not much alter behavior, there is a new mood in the pack. The breeding season has begun. Jamie realizes that both Chamuk and her sister Wyakin are in heat. It has not gone unnoticed by the males in the pack. The Alpha is usually the only male to mate. We expected him to choose one of the two sisters, but which? Wyakin seemed to us the likely candidate. But Kamats fastened his attention on Chamuk, to our surprise, and perhaps to hers as well. She had risen a long way. Once nearly an Omega, she would now become the mate of the leader. Wolves normally pair off for life, and now Chamuk would not only be the mother in the family, but the alpha female the dominant member of the female hierarchy. Mm -hmm. 
I remembered her as the little puppy who played by herself. We thought she might become an Omega, but now she was a chosen leader of the pack, while her sister could only look on. Attention turns to affection. Usually, only the alpha pair mate. The future size and fate of the entire pack will depend on the ritual of breeding they now begin. Gradually, the winds and warmth of approaching spring loosen the icy grip of winter. As the days lengthen in the Sawtooth Mountains, the milder temperatures are mirrored in the relaxed, sunny mood of the pack. Shamuk, however, has seemed increasingly withdrawn. While the rest of the family plays, it is noticed that Shamuk often disappears for long periods. Now, on a late April day, she slips away on a solitary mission. Curious, her sister Wyakin follows at a distance. In the past few weeks, she has burrowed out a den. This day, the time at hand, she seeks its privacy. For a few moments, the life of the pack seems to stop in anticipation. Few events so excite wolves as the arrival of new puppies, leading the entire pack to gather with an air of celebration. just beginning to open. Denied the role of mother, Wyakin seems curious about the pups. A new aunt, she settles in to serve as a babysitter while Shamuk takes a rest yards away. All wolves adore puppies. From the beginning, they are cared for tenderly by the entire pack and bathed in affection. excitement over new pups seems to inspire a mood of contentment. Now 11 in all, they sleep unaware that their future holds momentous change. As summer approaches, daily life in the sawtooth pack is still dominated by the presence of puppies. Long the pack puppy sitter, the beta wolf, Matsi, has again elected to look after the young. Though the entire pack helps to raise and instruct the puppies, now nine weeks old, Matsi seems uniquely devoted. There are three, all born with boundless energy and the urge to compete. The Dutchers hope to reveal in their work this hidden, gentle side of wolves. Believing them vicious, we Westerners have killed about two million wolves since moving to North America although records show wild wolves have killed none of us. But none of us have previously had the benefit of seeing their family life. 
Kamats will discipline gently and teach. Shamuk will remain a vigilant mother. But all of the adults will share in the task of watching over the puppies. Sometimes it's all they can handle. As I watched the pack interact with Jamie, I realized the time had come to move them. They were calm and happy, and the puppies would be a distraction as the wolves confronted a new and unfamiliar setting. We decided it was time to make preparations to move the pack and say goodbye. For two weeks, the pack follows its normal routines, unaware a plan is being devised that will dramatically alter their lives. To minimize stress, the Dutchers and their crew set transport crates in the pack's territory in advance giving them time to inspect and grow familiar with objects they've never before encountered. The crew hopes to anticipate and prevent any development that could frighten the wolves, potentially breaking bonds carefully nurtured. The adults are leery at first, but the pups seem merely inquisitive, unlikely to be bothered by the move at all. The day of the move is one of tension and deep concern. Like a worried father, Jim carefully supervises every step. The crew injects a sedative to ease the transfer into crates, taking every precaution to avoid causing trauma and making the wolves fearful. The puppies need no sedative and seem to take it all in stride. They depart late in the afternoon, judging that travel in the cool of the night will be least stressful for the wolves. Behind the pack leaves the familiar sights and smells of a home they'll never see again. Ahead, a 10-hour drive northward through the night to Winchester, Idaho. On Nez Perce tribal land early the next morning, the Dutchers and their crew will learn if the move has traumatically affected the pack. Carla High Eagle waits to welcome the wolves on her tribe's behalf. At first glance, the wolves seem anxious but unharmed. Jim decides to release the puppies first. They seem a little bewildered, but undisturbed. Kamats is next. The Alpha is cautious, but does not appear upset.
Motsi, the caretaker, also in good shape. The pack has come through the experience without distress. In the last crate, more nervous than the others, Lakota, the Omega, holds back. Both leader and brother, Kamats encourages him. Lakota emerges, careful not to wander far from his brother's side. The adjustment to new surroundings is swift. Romping excitedly, they set out to explore, using scent as much as sight. Where humans would smell only forest, the pack smells the forest's thousands of separate aromas. Discovering the kind of rocky vantage point wolves love, Kamotz rallies the pack around him. For the Dutchers, the pack's happiness is a tremendous relief. For the Nez Perce, it's an opportunity to rekindle a close association from the past. Through Carla and the Nez Perce, we've come to understand that the tribe and the wolf share a common heritage. Both nearly annihilated, both have managed to survive. By providing land so my crew and the foundation can continue to care for and study the wolves, the Nez Perce now offer the Sawtooth Pack a chance to live on and to reveal to humanity the gentle side of animals so long misunderstood. Before the Dutchers say their final farewells to the pack, the tribe greets the wolves with a time-honored ceremony of welcome. The ancient tradition invoked in song was one of deep respect for the spirit of the wolf. Most Native Americans regarded wolves not as enemies, but teachers. They sought to emulate the cohesiveness and self-sacrifice of wolf families, to imitate the alertness of the wolf as they hunted, its courage as they rode to battle, Many revere the wolf as an embodiment of their own cherished ideal, both a strong and proud individual and a fiercely loyal member of the tribe. For Jim Dutcher, the time has come to relinquish custody of wolves he knows as friends. The warmth that will last a lifetime. And so, for me, it's farewell to the Sawtooth Pack and goodbye to Matomo and Amani, Lakota, Shamuk, Wyakin, and Wahats. And I always have two special ones, Matsi, sweet and brave, and Kamats, the leader of the pack, the alpha leader. Thank you. Amid the echoes of drums and history, in a setting reminiscent of an earlier time, the years of companionship end between two people and 11 wolves. The myth of wolves as vicious beasts seems far removed this day, replaced by an image of curious and intelligent animals bonded to their families and gentle towards humans they trust. Now, a bittersweet moment. It is time for the Duchess to say goodbye one friend at a time. Lakota is first. I'm gonna miss you guys. Now Kamatz, the leader, approaches, as so often before, with paw extended in friendship. Finally, Matsi, sweet, brave, protector and peacemaker, perhaps the hardest for Jim to leave. You're always going to be on my mind. 
It'll always be in my heart. But I think this is going to be fun. I'm going to miss you. Affectionate, but still wild, they turn back toward their new destiny. Here they will remain unique ambassadors for their kind, displaying the true nature Dutcher has come to know. Caring animals devoted above all else to their family. During all my film projects, I've developed close connections with the animals, but none so strong as with these wolves. I will never forget my time with them. After all, I was there bottle feeding them when they first opened their eyes. What wonderful, rich memories I have of the joy they seemed to express when we returned to camp, or the sad howls when we departed. I actually believe they will miss us as much as we will miss them. Our bond is that strong.